Welcome to Coronavirus Chronicle. I'm Lisa Gray, a reporter for the Houston Chronicle. And since March 10th, before Houston's mayor shut down the rodeo, I've been checking in frequently with disaster recovery expert Angela Blanchard. While president of Baker Ripley Neighborhood Centers, Blanchard helped guide Houston's response to many disasters. For instance, when people displaced by Katrina began pouring into Houston, she was one of the people who got the call. Now, she frequently consults on long-term disaster recovery around the world. And at Brown University, she teaches a graduate-level public policy class on disaster and displacement. We talked with her today at her home in Houston's Museum District, where she's observing Harris County's stay-at-home order. Angela, thanks for being with us today. What was the first time that you dealt with a giant disaster? Well, I grew up on the Gulf Coast. So my first introduction to hurricanes was I believe Audrey when a tree fell on our house. So that that was my um my introduction and then of course growing up in Beaumont, Texas, we actually lived across the road from the mobile plant. So we lived with sort of the twin possibilities of hurricanes and plant explosions as the parentheses around our lives. The first real professional disaster awakening came in Allison for me because we saw an event that we didn't quite expect. Uh, We had a history of hurricanes. They come in, they go out, we pick up the pieces, we go on. They're two-week events, three-week events in my childhood. Allison was a different story. At the time, you were president of Neighborhood Center, so you were trying to help people in poverty you know, we were serving seniors and we were serving low-income families in some of Houston's most, in my mind, precious neighborhoods So uh, that were hard hit by Allison. It sometimes is hard for us to remember that in that same year, Allison was followed by 9-11 in September. So Allison in June hit Houston and we weren't quite recovered. Then it was, then it was uh, 9-11 and then the fall of Enron, et cetera the dominoes in the oil and gas trading industry started to topple. And so we were sitting as a city where the world is sitting now with this major threat and um, a bobbling economy. I just remember all the fear associated with that. And one critical thing, there we were and with the greatest need we had ever had for assistance and support and giving right when all the people that generally provided the assistance and support were themselves navigating a kind of unthinkable landscape of industry collapse. And that ties right into the twin problems we're facing now. How do you see this crisis? Where do you think we are in it? What do you think is the greatest need facing Houston now? I'm just going to fast forward from the 23 days ago that uh, where we were all uh, vague, vaguely aware there was a virus. And then we, in 23 days, we've all become epidemiologists and uh, disease spread experts and market watchers and, and a regular visit to see what the barrel of oil is today. I'm going to pause and just share this one tiny story so that people can understand what surge means. So you have to picture that the bed capacity is a pond. And in the pond are two lily pads. And those lily pads are doubling each day. And at 40 days, the pond's gonna be covered, beds will be used up. What is the day when it's half covered? See, we we think it's gonna be 20 days. We kind of imagine that these things sort of develop in some loping along manner. But in fact, it's day 39 that it's half covered. On day 40, all the beds are gone. We've watched countries and cities elsewhere go from okay to what looks like a catastrophic emergency the next day, because that's what surge looks like. That's how it works. And then we continue with doubling from there. This is what we have all asked people to make sacrifices for, to avoid that moment. In the minds of disaster, uh, those of us who think all the time, anticipators, I call us, this is this is what we dread. It's the one thing that triggers the other thing. And then it, at some point, you're not sure which of the two is the most devastating. We've heard this terrible and painful conversation around, do we really 
uh, sacrifice our economy, our worldwide economy, uh, to save the lives of the people in our countries and cities. And of course, we're one by one, city by city, country by country, and heaven hopes individual by individual making that decision, making the decision to stay home, to forego economic activity in favor of protection for ourselves and families, and actually to save the lives of people, many of whom we may not ever meet. And at the same time, that's creating its own painful um, and terrible set of consequences for people whose livelihoods are at stake. And in Houston, both because of the shutdown of critical employment sectors, and then, of course, with the decline of oil prices, then many of the people who normally are doing quite well are now faced with, uh, themselves faced with the prospect of either losing their jobs or anticipating the less certain future. You've put together non-specific disaster playbooks that recommend courses of action for almost any crisis. What is the usual recommendation? There was a time when we expected institutions that we built to show up and rescue us when things got too heavy, too difficult, and, and overwhelming. And I think we've seen that those institutions haven't evolved quickly enough and aren't responsive enough to deal with what we face now and how with the speed with which it unfolds. So. I say no one's coming, not as a message of despair, not because we should feel abandoned, but because we should be reminded that we're who's coming. We're here. This is our city, our county, our region. After Katrina, I wrote a simple paper about stages and I wrote another. Those two papers made their way around the world. Then came invitations. So then I began traveling to places uh, for example, in Australia, where until recently the hottest fire on earth had burned and devastated King Lake. I'd been in Brisbane for floods in Germany as they were resettling 1.1 million Syrians, which was uh, so incredibly reminiscent of Houston's uh, efforts to welcome people from New Orleans. I started to think, you know, there's a pattern here. And here are the nine things everybody must do in the face of uh, the unthinkable. There's a pattern to leadership behavior that really works. And then there's a pattern to help that's really useful. And the leaders that fare the best, that guide their cities and communities and, and companies um, through and to the other side are those that took action immediately. No one's coming. They didn't wait. They used the information at their fingertips. What they, they took stock of what they understood and the resources and assets in the arena and doing what they could with what they had, they started to make decisions and move forward. These were principled leaders, largely. These were people that had already a long time ago made up their minds about how to get through things. And, you know, what I love about our region, uh, what, what gives me heart here is, you know, I used to jokingly say it was not, it was not hard to raise money from people with money in Houston, because most of the people with money had already been broke a few times and they understood it wasn't a moral condition. So, you know, we've been up and down and people here understand that good fortune is, is partly fortune and partly hard work. You know, those leaders that look at the whole consider not just their customers, but also their suppliers and their partners and their vendors and then their neighbors and their friends, and they're looking at the whole and feeling a sense of responsibility for the whole. They actually make better decisions even for their own companies when they look at the whole than when they focus exclusively on what's their job. That holistic, improvisational willingness to work with incomplete information and then not waiting for rescue is a great posture from which to lead when you're faced with unprecedented circumstances. In responding to a disaster, what sorts of leaders need to be front and center? Who needs to be in front of regular human beings telling them what they need to hear? So I'm super dogmatic on a couple of things and just stubbornly won't give them up because I figure if it, if, if you've seen it on six continents and in 12 countries, there's a good chance it's just true. So I've never seen any sort of effective response or recovery that was designed and delivered in, uh, by one sector. We need three sectors. We need the philanthropic and nonprofit sector always. The mission focus and the mission-driven people in those sectors 
will step up and do what needs to be done. You've got to have the private sector because they have resources, they have drive, they have focus. Um, and you need the public sector because they're writing the rules that allow you to uh, either ignore or bend all of the policies that need to be ignored and bent when the unprecedented happens. Those three sectors at the table, each with their individual, with their sector strengths and capacities woven together is powerful. We could write a book on that in this region because every response to every storm in this region has been in the short term and the long term a three-sector response. One thing that has helped many Texans get through tough times is a face that they could trust telling them the truth. So in you know my 13 bits of wisdom, those leaders that practice when I know it, you know it, they gain trust and they gain followers and people will be willing to be guided by them certainty is not necessary, but transparency and honesty really are. So when uh, Scott McClellan, Scott McClellan of HEB, HEB, yes, uh, Scott McClellan tells us, you know, the food supply is secure. I can restock the shelves, showed up in clearly prepared ways in Harvey. You know, when HEB loaded its trucks, pulled them out to the HOV lanes, positioned them there, prior to the storm, you know, that might have been in the past something we would have thought FEMA might do, but it was HEB that did it. If there was a problem with the food supply, we'd hear that from Scott as well. So those of us who may not be in the loftiest positions of power, what we want from those people is tell us the truth. Tell it fast, tell it often, repeat it. Let us know, you think of these facts as sort of the container within which we'll all be making decisions. Uh, yesterday, we had a good exchange with uh, the Center for Houston's P Future. I was talking about the dashboard that I keep on my desk. What are the 10 things I'm looking at every single day to see the shape and size of this? Now, Lisa, you know, if it was a hurricane, we'd all be watching the screen. And here's the size of it. Here's the speed of it. This is where we think it. Here's what the European model says. Here's what the American model says. We're so hurricane literate. We could all just we, we can all tell you what the dirty side looks like. And when the eye passes, we've got it down. We're struggling now to understand what's the equivalent of wind speed for a virus. What's the equivalent? of the dirty side for this storm. And then the other thing that's really challenging for us is we can see a storm. We see it on our screens and we see it when the trees are, are bending at 45 degree angles. And then we see the aftermath and we see the debris f piled in the streets. The suffering is visible. The challenges are palpable. Where we are now is the trees have begun to blow we don't quite understand its size. We're looking at the places it's already hit and it looks really, really bad. So what I keep on my screen, this is my dashboard. How many cases? How much testing? What's the supply? What's the anticipated need? And what's the supply of PPE and other equipment that our first responders and health professionals will need. How many people, on one side of the equation, we're looking at the virus itself and the disease spread. What does surge look like in this region? How many seriously ill people will constitute our surge? What's the bed capacity? You know, this is important. I'd like to know when we're gonna hit that. So now on the economic side of my dashboard, I'm looking at how many people have already let landlords know that they're gonna have trouble with their rent. How many people have already been laid off? And now remember in Houston, we, we you hear them talk much more about the low income families and the people that are working for low wages, but also in Houston, there are two income families that'll become one income families because of oil and gas. So we're looking at two kinds of major shifts in employment and what that means. Uh, so unemployment, how many people have filed? What are, what do the filings look like for small businesses uh, and medium-sized businesses for bankruptcy? How many of them are prepared and understand how to move forward with the reliefs that have been written into the CARE Act? So that dashboard is extremely important. Then there's the one that I think of as the, the nonprofit 
sector purview. You know, so I'm talking with Anna Babin, who at United Way is always on top, got the finger on the pulse. You know, so if you look at the 211 calls, they've had this massive increase, 150,000 211 calls to United Way in the past month. And what do you think the top questions were? They want to understand about the virus. They want to know where to go if they get sick, number one. Number two, rent assistance. Number three, food. So we see already that that means the hurricane has landed and people are feeling it. But unlike the, the wind blowing and the rain falling, we can't see it. Those metrics about who's calling and for what, uh, that's extremely important to pay attention to. What are the calls to the emergency hotlines? You know, what are those people asking for to the mental health hotlines? What are people experiencing there? If we think about the leaders needed in their arena, when we line them up with that dashboard, you know, this is the shape of what we're facing. If we can embrace it and its complexity and understand how each of these things impacts the other, we have a shot at having more say about our destiny than we do if we passively wait or if we hunker down in our own siloed arenas and focus only on our own institutions. Is that dashboard a thing that other people can look at? Do you have a copy? Is somebody working on it? Reddit and I did some brainstorming about what that would look like and what are the sources of good information right now. So really shout out in all fairness to the Chronicle for for keeping us on top of some of the critical developments. People learn best words, pictures, numbers. So what we're getting out of the Chronicle is the words, the pictures, and some of the numbers we need to navigate. You know, we just can't captain our own ship without any navigational equipment. So this dashboard, I think, exists mostly in on my desktop in my brain at this moment. I'm not the only, not far from the only leader that's understanding that all of these metrics shape how we're going to get through this. We know, for example, if we do more testing, and we get a better grasp on the size of the, of the infected population, and the, then we're going to know right away when we start to have a decline. And if we understand when we have a decline, then we're going to have a projection about when we get to reopen businesses. So these things are interacting with one another in an unseen way. But if we can make the invisible, this invisible disaster, if we can make it visible on the screen and give us, give us all a picture of what we're dealing with and who's in charge of each of these elements, then I think we can be a little more consciously coordinated, uh, uh, consciously cooperative and, and coordinated in how we move through it. I don't want this to sound like some idealistic impossibility. Lots of people are thinking this way. And I think I'm merely articulating what most good leaders are coming to terms with in the last week or so. I think next week is going to bring a real, a real surge of, of connection between sectors and leaders and people reaching out across institutions. I, you know, I've said to a lot of my business clients, look, you know, you've won by competing well. You'll win this one by collaborating well. Um, because some of the people you competed with a month ago might be your best source of understanding and insight for what's ahead. We need different structures, new structures of communication, connection, and collaboration. What else are you thinking about? Or is that it? Eating somebody cooking besides my own. <laughs> <laughs> I have nothing to whine about at all. Not, not a thing in the world. Uh, but when I'm tempted to, it's because, you know, I'm facing another one of the Angela Blanchard's culinary creations and they're, they're, you know, they're, they're, that's a miniature disaster in a pot every day at my house. <laughs> a lot of scrambled eggs and jalapenos. Yeah, that's, that's my specialty. That one's guaranteed to turn out well. <laughs> but um, everything I'm seeing, everything I'm saying points to one thing. History tells us this. Experiences around the world tell us this. Uh, the human spirit is not extinguishable. If you're alive today, you descended from all the people that survived the plagues, the genocides, the disasters, the floods, the droughts. You know, within us, we have the capacity 
to do two things. One is to rise to the challenge of working through this, seeing our way to the other side together. And then the more deep and somewhat spiritual challenge of coming to terms with the suffering and loss that we're going to face is a loss of livelihoods, the businesses and the restaurants we love that won't be there when we go back, the venues that aren't functioning, the companies and the plans and the promises parents have made to children that won't be realized because the income's not there to do it. These are losses that that we should mourn. Um, so with those great losses uh, comes a deep grief um, and then also gratitude. And I remind people all the time that gratitude and grief at every milestone uh, will have both and they have to live side by side in our hearts together. All right. Thanks a lot, Angela. Remember, subscribing to the Houston Chronicle supports all of our work, including this podcast. Coronavirus Chronicle will be back on Monday with Farrell Gibbs. Have a good weekend and stay safe. <laughs>